Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, session number seven, the Genetics and Infectious Disease. I'm Scott Williams, and I'll be chairing this session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the afternoon for you, early morning for me, uh, Dr. Yusuf Idagdor. He is a assistant professor of biology and co-principal investigator at the Public Health Res uh, the Public Health Research Center at NYU uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, he has a, a research program that examines population and medical genomics of complex traits in the UAE and Africa. His uh, research focus over the years has been using multi-omic and high-dimensional data sets uh, with in with together with uh, bioinformatics and complex statistical analyses to analyze the data that focus on gene environment interactions and host immune responses to malaria. Today he's going to be speaking to us on genetic and environmental determinants of host response. Yusuf, it's my pleasure to introduce you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to present at the, uh, at the meeting. So today I'm going to be talking about some of our recent funding on uh, the work that we've been doing since actually the last meeting in Kigali. And our research program focuses on understanding both genetic and the environmental factors that affect host response to infection. Uh, you can imagine how complex malaria is and the number of factors that can affect how different individuals and populations and ethnic groups uh, respond to infection. So as the, um, in, during the course of infection, as the parasite goes, undergoes the liver stage, then transitions into the blood stage, the immune system tries to control the infection or eliminate the, uh, the parasite. But you can also imagine the number of interactions that can take place between the parasite and the host, and that's basically the focus of our work. And this is all to say that malaria is very complex, like, like most infectious diseases anyways. So the number of factors that can define the outcome of the infection range from factors related to the parasite itself, to its genetic makeup, to the functional output of the parasite, its RNA, its proteins and metabolites, as well as the host genetic factors. Again, ranging from genetic, epigenetic uh, factors, host molecules. And on top of this, you have a lot of the uh, processes that relate specifically to the immune system and the environment. So environmental factors as well can in, uh, affect these uh, sort of interactions. So the focus of our studies have been uh, transcriptomics or gene expression profiling in the last decade or so. And more recently, we've been trans transitioning to uh, looking at other types of functional outputs in the system, like the metabolome. So it's fascinating when you think how um, two organisms, one with a few thousand genes and one with 22,000 protein coding genes, interact with each other during this course of uh, infection. And these interactions are very important because they really define the outcome of the infection, whether it relates to the phenotypes or the traits of the, of the human host, or the traits of the that are related to the parasite like parastemia. And in, in the, all, all of these processes, as I mentioned earlier, can be affected by genetic and environmental factors. So the program that we set up that I presented, uh, I think five years ago, is the, in Burkina Faso. So we have a wonderful collaboration with the team of Dr. Uh, Sulema Isiaka. And since then, we decided to uh, recruit a cohort. It's a small cohort of 150 children from the Guan ethnic group in, in uh, the Bamfora region of Burkina Faso. And we decided to focus completely on in vivo phenotypes. And the idea was really to sample children over time uh, during the course of infection, before infection, after infection, uh, and, and in, in two or three years of time. And this really requires a lot of collaboration from the local community leaders and nurses and a wonderful team of uh, young African scientists as well that are part of the uh, team of uh, uh, ISIACA. So in terms of the technical approaches that we use in this program, they, uh, we try to really maximize how we can use these biological samples. So, and our focus again is blood stage malaria. So what we do, we collect blood samples and we developed uh, a lot of protocols to be able from relatively small samples of volumes of blood 
to be able to do DNA work, RNA work, serum, as well as PBMCs. And today I'm gonna to be focusing mainly on the work that uh, we've been doing in the last, uh, I would say, five years, which is mainly on total RNA-seq, microRNA, and metabolomics. So for the first study, which is really focused on looking at the uh, immune response uh, in relation to microRNA, and I actually I presented the preliminary results of this project in Kigali, and, but since then we made a lot of progress and uh, that's what I'm gonna be presenting in the next 10 minutes. So the idea was really simple. We want to focus on a group of children before infection and the design, because malaria is, is, is seasonal in, 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 in Burkina Faso, we have an opportunity to actually sample children before infection and follow them over time and do weekly visits uh, and sometimes bi-weekly visits and we can really track when they get infected. And in this regard, we've been able to uh, sample about 20 children during the asymptomatic parasitemia stage, meaning that they don't show any symptoms, but we've actually detected the parasite in their blood. And then we keep following them again on a weekly basis till they have symptoms, and then we sample them again. And then they are given the uh, uh, treatment and we sample them three weeks after. And again, this is a match design, which means that it's a very nice way to control for other variables. And so it's not a cross-sectional design. So we've done this for one year, and then we went back the following year where we did the replication study where we focused mainly on symptomatic parasitemia, and again in the same area of Burkina Faso. So once we have blood samples, we extract total RNA and we construct a microRNA library. It's quite different from my, uh, uh, like a regular uh, RNA-seq library. It has extra steps because you have to run a gen and cut exactly the band with the microRNA. Uh, transcripts are, and as you can see here, the, uh, the, uh, the microRNA library, as you can see here, was very nicely captured, and then we do sequencing. And using this method, we detected 320 microRNAs in these individuals, and this is uh, actually exactly the plot that I think I presented in Kigali uh, a couple of years ago. So what we see here, we do differential microRNA expression analysis, which means that we want to detect which microRNA go up or down, and because we have the four stages, we can really see exactly those changes uh, in, uh, and how they change over time. So as you can see in the first plot, the, uh, we have some microRNA that are upregulated and some other microRNA are downregulated. And this is from before infection to the asymptomatic uh, parasitemia stage, which really tells you that there are ch changes that are taking place early during the infection. And then once the children transition to uh, the uh, symptomatic parasitemia stage, you can see some sort of an amplification of signal with the same microRNA being uh, magnified in terms of the up or down regulation, in addition to other microRNA that are also differentially expressed. And what's very interesting is that after treatment, three weeks after treatment, you see the opposite effect. So what we see here is like the if the micronome reverts to before infection status. So microRNA that are upregulated during asymptomatic parasitemia start to actually be downregulated and vice versa. MicroRNA that are downregulated during asymptomatic parasitemia, they start to go in up again. And this is again, really a clear indication of how fast changes in microRNA can take place in the uh, blood of children. So in the replication study, we've focused mainly on parasitemia as one of the main phenotypes that we are interested in. And we were very pleased to actually uh, detect a lot of microRNA that are positively correlated with par parasitemia that are upregulated during infection and vice versa, with the exception of one microRNA. So this was really indicative of a potential association between parasitemia and those microRNA, hence probably a functional, uh, with some functional consequences. And in total, we've detected 127 microRNA that are either induced by infection or are associated with parasitemia. And that was the focus of our uh, uh, works uh, in the last couple of years. So to show you examples, these are two microRNA that one is positively correlated with parasitemia and one is negatively correlated with parasitemia. And when we see these patterns, you basically there is no direct link between parasitemia and microRNA. MicroRNA, they, they have regulatory roles. So they target specific uh, messenger RNAs. 
And to be able to try to detect them, what we did, we did RNA seq profiling of the same children. And then we did cross correlation between RNA seq for messenger RNA and RNA seq for microRNA. And we've detected over 1,000 pairs of microRNA and messenger RNA that are anti correlated. And that was our focus because an anti correlation or negative correlation between the two hints to the fact that those microRNA are actually inhibiting those uh, messenger RNA or causing degradation, or, and, and, and hence you won't have uh, a translation from uh, messenger RNA. And here again, I'm showing two examples of those uh, uh, pairs of microRNA and target messenger RNA. Uh, and because uh, these pairs of microRNA, messenger RNA, some of them have actually been functionally validated as being targets and not just uh, predicted uh, using computational methods that was our focus. And the most interesting gene that we discovered is BSL2, which is an anti-apoptotic gene. Now, when we take the thousand messenger RNA that are negatively correlated with microRNA, we did enrichment analysis and we discovered that the top pathway that is actually enriched is cell death and survival. Other, other pathways are also affected, but our focus was really on this cell death and survival. And the reason for that is because of this gene, BSL2, which is an anti-apoptotic gene. So which means when the gene is expressed, the cells don't undergo apoptosis. If the gene is downregulated, then you trigger apoptotic processes. We looked, and this is looking at the data from the uh, uh, replication uh, study. When we look in the uh, discovery study, we see also very nice anti-correlation in all the stages of infection. You can clearly see how when this microRNA goes up, this target gene goes down. And then we decided to really further this, uh, uh, look at this further because the uh, potential consequence of these changes is that it will trigger, trigger apoptosis of immune genes in the system. And because we have uh, generated uh, the, uh, the uh, lymphocyte counts from these children, we've seen a very nice correlation between lymphocyte counts and the BSL2 gene or an anti-correlation between the microRNA and the lymphocyte, which hints again to an effect that has consequences on lymphocyte counts. We did, we did a follow-up with a, uh, a nice small functional assay where we took this microRNA 16 and we did a controlled experiment with hex cells and HeLa cells where we could show that uh, actually this, indeed, this microRNA actually triggers apoptosis, as you can see here, with, so, so with cell viability dropping from 100% to uh, about 70% on average. Okay, so uh, as a follow-up of this, we decided to really look at the genetic makeup of these children and see if some of these uh, microRNA are actually genetically controlled. And because we have whole genome sequencing data from this cohort, We've done an uh, EQTL study for this microRNA, and we discovered 34 microRNA that are controlled uh, that are controlled by regulatory SNPs. And all these SNPs, because of the limited power of this analysis, we focused completely on uh, cis effects and completely ignored trans effects for this analysis. And what you can see here, this is a Manhattan plot that shows some examples. This is one of the most interesting uh, signals that we detected. It's this microRNA. Uh, here, microRNA 598, which is associated with this SNP. And as you can see here, the minor allele uh, uh, is associated with low expression of this microRNA. And this is just fine mapping to see that the signal actually is nicely captures, the, despite actually the challenges of association mapping in, Af in Africa because of the LD structure of the population. So, this again, we're very pleased with this result because again, this shows the importance of using in the phenotypes in African populations where you can gain actually a lot of power. Now, when we look at the, if we completely ignore microRNA and we look at the association between the SNP and parastemia, we've actually see, we see this correlation or this association with the minor allele associated with low levels of parastemia, which is really interesting. We, we've seen the same signal between microRNA and the infection stage in our uh, discovery. Uh, cohort. And interestingly, we see this very nice strong co positive correlation between parastemia and microRNA. And the model really that we came up with 
is really suggestive that there is an effect of this SNP on thalassemia, and it's mediated by microRNA. And this was supported by statistical analysis of the data. Now, the, the, this is much more complex than what I'm showing you here, because you can, as I mentioned earlier, um, for the BSL2 gene, we don't know for sure what are the target genes of this microRNA and how it relates to parasitemia in terms of this positive correlation that we see here. And that's basically the focus of our next uh, research on this topic. So I didn't go over all the details that we went through in this project, but these results have been published last year in this publication, if you are interested. Okay, so next we decided to really switch our focus to uh, studying the metabolome of those children. And the metabolome is, is very interesting in many ways. So metabolites are small molecules that are present in the system that we are studying. And they, they are much more reflective of physiology. They are much more closely uh, uh, or close to phenotypes compared to microRNA or messenger RNA, for example. And that was really one of the main reasons why we wanted to look at them. So the model that we have is that metabolites can change with infection. And these metabolites can have effects on host gene expression. They can also affect directly immune response of the host, but they can also affect parasitemia or any other trait of the, of the parasite. And those interactions can also be vice versa, meaning that uh, metabolites can be byproducts of uh, biological processes of the parasite or the host. So it's really a nice system to look at parasite, uh, host parasite interactions. Okay, so what we did, we went and back to the same cohort, the Guan cohort, and in this case, we, we've uh, profiled more individuals. So we focused on 100 individuals before infection and during infection. And you can see here basically that no parasitemia was detected before infection. And during infection, you can see this very nice uh, range of parasitemia levels going from very low to very high parasitemia. And then we isolated serum samples and we did high resolution metabolomic profiling using the metabolome uh, platform. With this data, we've done a lot of annotation of these metabolites and we focus completely on the known metabolites. With these metabolites, then we can do uh, analysis that are similar to what we do with gene expression, including PCA, differentially abundance analysis, and pathway enrichment analysis. Okay, so the first question we wanted to answer is, okay, what is the impact of infection on, on serum metabolome? Does the metabolome change with infection? This is the number, total number of metabolites that we detected in the serum of these uh, children. So in total, 667, and they have they, they belong to different classes. Uh, mainly lipids and amino acids are the two major classes, but there are other classes, as you can see in the figure. So when we do principal component analysis of this data, you can see very clearly the effect of infection on the metabolome. So in blue, you have the children before infection. In the red, you have the same children, because remember, this is matched analysis. So the red are the same children after infection, and you see this nice separation between the two, which again clearly shows that the effect of infection is very strong on the metabolome. Next, we did the uh, differential abundance analysis, and we used these thresholds for change greater than 1.5, and if they are of 10%. And in, in this analysis, basically, we detected uh, 195 metabolites that are either enriched or depleted. So enriched in red, as you can see here, or depleted, as you can see in blue here. And in triangles, I'm showing you the metabolites that are associated with parasitemia. And again, very, very similar to what we've seen with microRNA, the, almost all the uh, my, metabolites that are actually upregulated during infection are positively associated with parasitemia and vice versa. Okay, now we, we take this data and we do a pathway enrichment analysis. We've seen a lot of signal in this data that most top like enriched pathways really, really reflect the biology of the parasite. And today, because uh, my focus is really the host, I'm not going to be talking about uh, this uh, data that relates to the parasite. So I'm going to focus completely on the host immune response. So specifically what really attracted our attention was this uh, signal that we've seen in terms of the uh, steroid biosynthesis or steroidogenesis. This was really surprising to us, uh, in large part because of the role of steroids in uh, immune regulation. And this is also take home message to really not always focus just on the pathways that are uh, 
the most significant. Sometimes you can have a really strong biological signal in, in pathways that are not necessarily the most significant. Okay, so when we look at steroids, they, they are actually the most, the, the most uh, abundant class of molecules that is uh, differentially abundant. And when we look specifically at those that are associated with parastemia and that are elevated, we detected 20, uh, sorry, 12 out of, 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 of 37 being, uh, being in this class, which is, means upregulation and associated with parastemia. And here I'm showing you a heat map of the data where you can see them. And you can clearly see, so each column is one child, and we have basically 100 children here, and the same 100 children here. And there is a perfect clustering based on, on infection status. And you can see in red, which reflects the levels going up, you can see that all of them basically going up after infection. Here I'm showing you an example of a uh, steroid called pregnidiol sulfate. And you can clearly see that the, the, uh, this metabolite or this steroid goes up after infection. And it is, as, as you see here, it is associated with palestinia. Okay, so steroids, as I mentioned, are really interesting. They are classes of molecules that are sex hormone precursors, but can also function as inflammatory regulators. And specifically, they have anti-inflammatory responses, which means that they dampen the uh, immune system. So because we have the uh, lymphocyte count, we decided to look at this, because if you have an elevation of, of anti-inflammatory molecules, you will be able to see uh, uh, down regulation or reduction of lymphocyte counts. So we did cor cross correlation between all these steroids and cell counts and hemoglobin. And as you can see here, we don't see any correlation whatsoever in, in, in positive or negative between lymphocytes and steroids, as you can see here uh, with one example. Interestingly, when we look at the, uh, the same data, but during infection, you can clearly see that we see this very strong negative correlation between the most of the steroids and lymphocyte counts, as you can see here, as well as negative correlation with parastemia. So this, we were very intrigued by, by this uh, finding because this really would hint to the, to the idea that these steroids, when they go up during infection, they will uh, have an effect on lymphocyte function. So to be able to gain more functional insight about this uh, hypothesis, we decided to go back to our transcriptomic data and we focused on 36 children and we did integrative analysis of metabolomic and transcriptomic data. We looked specifically at those 11 steroids and we cross-correlated them with over 12,000 transcripts. And we focus on uh, the uh, pairs of metabolites and steroids and RNAs that are significant. So in, on, we've done this in, in, in both the data sets before infection and during infection. And interestingly, before infection, we don't detect a lot of uh, significant correlations. As you can see here, 61 and 49, either negative or positive correlation. But during infection, this number uh, increases to over 1,500 negatively correlated pairs and over 2,000 possibly correlated steroid RNA pairs. To show you this is an example, this is a gene of interest because it's actually involved in one of the synthesis pathways of this metabolite or this steroid. And it, that's exactly what I mentioned earlier. You can see that before infection in blue, we don't see any correlation whatsoever between this gene and this metabolite. But during infection, you see this very strong correlation, positive correlation between expression of the gene and the steroid. And again, it makes complete biological sense because this gene is involved in the biosynthesis pathway of this steroid. And then we took all those genes that are uh, uh, significantly associated with these steroids, and we do ingenuity enrichment analysis, both in the before infection and during infection stage. And you can clearly see here that there is a signal that relates specifically to T cell function or lymphocytes in general. And this effect is not significant whatsoever before infection. And the Z-score here indicates either inhibition in blue or activation in red of those pathways. In particular, what I really would like to highlight are the fact that what we observe is a strong uh, inhibition of T-cell activation signaling pathways and strong activation of T-cell exhaustion signaling pathway, including the, the PDL1 signaling pathway. 
So again, a combination of activation and inhibition of pathways, but they all hint to inhibition of T cell function or lymphocytes in general. So I won't have time to go into the details. We've done a lot of uh, follow-up statistical analysis to really look at the, uh, at the effects between the transcriptome and the steroids and lymphocytes count. And they, they, uh, through this analysis that we call causal mediation moderation analysis, we now have strong evidence that these metabolites affect lymphocyte count through regulation of these master regulators of T cell function. This is the list that we looked at. And before infection, we don't see a strong signal or strong mediation signal for most of the genes. And as you can see here, during the infection, we see a very strong mediation effect. And when I say moderation on top of mediation, what I mean is, is that this effect is only seen during infection. Because keeping in mind those metabolites and genes are actually present before infection, but the relationship between them doesn't have any effect on lymphocyte counts before infection. We only see it during infection. Okay, now we, uh, because we have this strong evidence from, from integrative analysis and from statistical analysis, we went back to the lab and we did an ex vivo functional validation. We recruited 10 individuals and we looked at their PDMCs. And specifically what we do, we look at one of the strongest uh, steroids that we've detected and we culture those uh, uh, PBMCs. We stimulate them with anti-CD3, CD28. And then after, after 24 hours, we add the, uh, the steroid that we want to test. And the hypothesis is that if these steroids have an inhibitory effect on T cell function, we will be able to see that using FAX analysis. So as I mentioned, we've done this for uh, 10 individuals. Here I'm showing you the data for two individuals. And in the first plot here, what you can see, we, when we don't stimulate or add the steroid, we don't see any changes in, the, in these populations of cells. When we, add, when we don't stimulate and add the steroid, also nothing happens because this, this uh, steroid doesn't stimulate those cells. But, and when we only add stimulation, you can see the shift in this population of cells, which really is indicative of proliferation. And when we add the steroid, as you can see in these individuals, we are inhibiting very significantly proliferations of cells, and you don't see the shift that you can see here. Same thing for this individual, and this was done for 10 individuals. This is looking at the data from all the individuals that we have said. And what you can see here again is clear reduction in the proliferation index of uh, lymphocytes specifically in these individuals. So this kind of really supports all the hypotheses that were generated from the integrative analysis. Okay, so now just in the last two or three minutes, uh, I'll show you the most recent results that we obtained as part of this project. This is exactly what I showed you earlier. What we've seen is that in the one ethnic group, we've seen this elevation of steroids. We decided to go back to the field the following year and look at and ask specific questions. Of, okay, if we see this in the one, what happens in, in other ethnic groups? And in Burkina Faso, you have multiple ethnic groups. One of the most interesting groups are the Fulani, and the Fulani are known to have lower susceptibility to malaria relative to other ethnic groups. So when we did exactly replicated the study using exactly the same methodologies and exactly the same statistical analysis and combining the data, to our big surprise, we saw completely the opposite trend in the Fulani, as you can see here. So this is a volcano plot, uh, the same way as we generated this one. And what you see here, either those steroids, they don't change, or some of them actually are downregulated. We lose in statistical power here because we only had data from 53 individuals as opposed to 100 for the guan. This is a heat map that's showing you the data for these four classes. The guan before infection, after infection, Fulani before infection and after infection. And what's really, really interesting is what you see here. You can clearly see that the guan before infection are actually more similar to the Fulani who are infected, which really shows again that the Fulani, they don't respond the same way as the infected guan that you can see here, where we see this very significant upregulation. Just to show you an example, this is an example of one of those steroids going down in the uh, Fulani and going up in the, in the guan. This is a very nice example of, of an interaction effect again between uh, uh, ethnic group or, or, or ethnicity 
And I'm not here focusing on genetics or the environment. I'm really just looking at both ethnic groups with all the variables that they carry, whether it's genetics or environment. To show you the data, the lymphocyte data, which, which is also uh, uh, supports the evidence of our findings. What you see here in the, in the Fulani and in the one, there is no correlation between the uh, steroids and the lymphocyte counts, but in the one, you see this negative correlation that we don't see in the Fulani. So this is again indicative that in the Fulani, we don't see this, uh, this upregulation of anti-inflammatory uh, steroids, which supports the idea that they, and this is already known actually about the Fulani, that they have this uh, property of uh, uh, a stronger immune response when, when they are infected. So with this, uh, just as a summary, so the model that really we're well proposing here is that uh, what we're discovering in the Guan ethnic group is that there is this elevation of steroids that are associated with, with infection and parasitemia, which have an inhibitory effect on T cell function and potentially on other cells as well, which also can affect parasitemia. And we see opposing trends in the Fulani and the Guan, this negative correlation between steroids and lymphocytes, which we don't see in the Fulani. And if you are interested in more details, this, uh, the results have been published in, the, uh, in Nature Metabolism in the issue of July, and also attracted a lot of attention from the community with some nice commentaries by uh, the immunology field and infectious disease as well. So with this, I really would like to thank a lot of people who contributed to this study, and in particular, the study participants and their families in Burkina Faso. And also on my collaborator, Isiaka Sulema, who was really instrumental in setting up the, the field operation for this work and three really talented uh, scientists and graduate students in my lab. Uh, while Abdrabu, who is a graduate student, Masar, Masar Dieng, is a research scientist, and Isa uh, Jawara is a postdoc uh, and a research scientist in the lab. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yosef, for a great talk as always. Um, I I can open it. We were intending to uh, hold off all the questions, but if anybody has one or two, uh, we can do a quick one. I do have one, Yusuf. Um, when I was looking at your original data with the miRNA and the uh, mRNA, you look at the correlation between them, and then at the end, you looked at the Fulani and the, their relative resistance. Have you considered examining the genetics of the correlation of these factors uh, to see whether they uh, associate with relative resistance, let's say, of the Fulani, for, or even genetic control of the response to uh, active infection? Uh, hmm. Yusuf, are you still there? Okay. Yeah, we'll carry on. Okay, the next uh, presentation will be by uh, Fatumata Kone, and it will be on ECOR1 polymorphism of APO protein B100, genes exon 29, and lipid profile in HIV infected patients. Uh, Dr. Kone is a pharmacist and a researcher working in multiple diseases. Uh, he is a lecturer at the Felix Hafouet Bonnier University and has qualifications as a pharmacist and in clinical biochemistry. Uh, he also is a uh, working at the Center for Research and Diagnosis of AIDS and Other Infectious Diseases in their Molecular Biology Unit. Um, and now we will start the presentation. Good morning, dear participants. I am Kone Fatmata. My presentation topic is about ECOR1 polymorphism of apoprotein B100 genes exon 29 and lipid profile in HIV-infected patients. As introduction, we know that HIV infection remains a public health problem. From who report, there were 37.6 million persons living with HIV worldwide in 2020. Infected persons treated or not by ART have often metabolic disorders such as 
this lipidemia a risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. However, all these patients do not develop this lipidemia, raising the suspicion that us related genetic predisposing factors influence the occurrence of this lipidemia. Several single nucleotide polymorphisms are associated with the occurrence of this disorder, particularly in apoprotein genes. It has been shown that HIV-associated dyslipidemia is accompanied by an increase in lipoproteins containing apoprotein B, particularly LDL cholesterol, which increase is known to be one of the predictive factors of the cardiovascular risk. Thus, the apoprotein B100 gene is one of the most studied genes of interest, particularly the ECOR1 polymorphism at position 4154, a missense mutation. This guanine to adenine substitution implies the loss of the restrictive site of this endonuclease and the change of amino acid from glutamic acid to lysine. The aim of this study was to establish the link between ECOR1 polymorphism in exon 29 of the ApoB100 gene in, and changes in serum lipoprotein profile in art knife patient living with HIV in Ivory Coast. About the material and method used, the study population consisted of HIV negative controls who were voluntary blood donors and persons living with HIV monitored at the National Blood Transfusion Center. All of them presented at least one disturbed lipid report in classical lipidemia and apoproteinemia. The laboratory for the biological analysis was the CEDRES laboratory. The primary spay used was named BC2 and BC2R with sequence of interest on exon 29 of ApoB100 gene. For the digestion step, we use the restrictive enzyme endonuclease ECOR1. We perform a cross-sectional study. World blood collected on EDTA and dry tubes was sent to CEDRES where alicode were done stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius, and then lipoprotein parameters were analyzed. Sociodemographic, therapeutic, and biological data were collected from the database of the first part of the study. Indeed, the first part of the study had already been carried out using these same samples in 2013. In order to determine the ECOR1 polymorphism, we performed PCR digestion and DNA electrophoresis. All recruited persons gave the informed con consent. The protocol was approved by the National Ethics and Research Committee. The collected data were analyzed using SPSS software. The presence of DNA digestion was noted plus and its absence minus. The comparison were made using student to test for quantitative values and t square or Fisher exact test for qualitative values. The tests were considered significant at the risk 5%. The Adivan Bear equilibrium was tested for allele distribution interpretation and the significant level was 3.84. A total of 55 subjects were recruited, consisted of 42% of at night persons living with HIV and 58% of HIV negative control. According to the sociodemographic cardiovascular risk factors, there was a male predominance in both groups, but there were no significant differences regarding gender and age distribution. The mean body mass index 
was higher in persons living with HIV than in HIV negative. The values were 24% versus 26, and the pure value was 0 0.046. Also, high body mass index values were more frequent in HIV infected people than HIV negative. The value were 63.6 versus 35.5 with pure value 0 0.043. According to serum lipid and apoprotein concentration levels, hypoapoproteinemia A1 was more frequent in persons living with HIV, and the pure value was 0 0.002. There was in both groups the predominance of hypertriglyceridemia, hyperapoproteinemia B, hyperapoproteinemia LP small a, as well as high atherogenicity indexes for both ratios. But the difference was significant only for the atherogenicity index defined by the ratio total cholesterol divided by HDL cholesterol. The pure value was 0.023. According to the ECOR1 polymorphism, the real genotype predominated in both groups and all three genotypes were found in both. The wheat allele predominated in HIV negative subject, while the mutant one predominated in person living with HIV. P value was 0 0.002. The adivide bed equilibrium were deviated in both HIV negative and person living with HIV subject. The P value were respectively 0 0.008 and less than 0.0001. About the distribution of genotypes and alleles according to the demographic cardiovascular risk factors, regardless of HIV status, genotype frequencies were not at a divine bell equilibrium for any of the demographic factors. The mutant allele was more frequent in those under 40 years of age, women, and those with high body mass index values. According to HIV status, in the HIV negative group, a divine equilibrium was deviated in those under 40 years of age, male, and those with high body mass index. In person living with HIV, the equilibrium was deviated in all subgroups with frequencies of a mutant allele in proportion higher than 10%. Studying the ECOR1 polymorphism according to serum lipid and apoprotein levels, regardless of HIV status, only the genotyping frequencies in subjects with high LDL cholesterolemia were at a divine bed equilibrium. The mutant allele was more frequent in subjects with increased triglyceridemia, LDL cholesterolemia, apoproteinemia LP small a, atherogenicity index total cholesterolemia divided by HDL cholesterolemia and apoproteinemia B100. In those with normal total cholesterolemia and in those with decreased HDL cholesterolemia and apoproteinemia a1. Taking HIV status into account, the mutant allele was more frequent in persons living with HIV than in HIV negative subject. The values were respectively 40 to 32 percent and 2 to 23 percent. Concerning the lipid concentration, the mutant allele was more frequent, especially in persons living with HIV, presenting total hypercholesterolemia, 28.1%, normal LDL cholesterolemia, 26.7%, HDL hypocholesterolemia, 27.3%, hyperapoproteinemia LP small A, 28.1%, and high 
atherogenicity index as total cholesterolemia divided by HDL cholesterolemia, 23.7%. For apoprotein concentration, the mutant allele was more frequent, especially in persons living with HIV, presenting hypoapoproteinemia A1, 32.1%, hyperapoproteinemia B, 128.1%, and high atherogenicity index as apoproteinemia B divided by apoproteinemia A1, 33.7%. In conclusion, the results observed in the general population differed from those in the person living with HIV group. The distribution of alleles was not random, and the mutant allele was more frequent in persons living with HIV. And this exposed them to increase the body mass index, atherogenic apolipoproteins, and atherogenicity index, and exposed them also to decrease the protective apolipoproteins. As perspective, in order to investigate the link between the effect of our treatment, apolipoprotein B100 and A1 genes variation, we are considering doing analysis on a population of persons living with HIV on our treatment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, we'll take questions at the end of the session for every all the speakers now. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Jasmine Olvaney, who will be, um, Jasmine is a PhD candidate at, um, at Case Western Reserve University in the Department of Genetics and Genome Sciences. She is working uh, jointly in the laboratories of Pete Zimmerman and myself. Um, and her thesis work, which she'll be presenting part of, revolves around uh, the problem of defining uh, the difficulty of uh, malaria elimination based on the presence and detection of the presence of asymptomatic individuals. Uh, prior to her degree, uh, prior to entering the PhD program, she was a Fulbright scholar in Budapest, Hungary, where she reached, researched uh, novel bioorthogonal dyes. Um, she is also actually interested in ceramics and jewelry fabrication and using art to communicate science. And Jasmine, uh, your talk will begin now. Hi, I'm Jasmine Olvaney, and I come from Case Western Reserve University in the US. And today I would like to talk to you a little bit about the research that went behind my abstract, which I've titled Detecting and Assessing the Epidemiology of Asymptomatic Malaria in Regions of Sub-Saharan Africa. Before I get into the actual meat of my uh, presentation, I wanna give you a little bit of a guide about the progression of my talk. And the reason I wanna do this is I just find it a little bit easier to keep your bearings while we're quickly going through the things I wanna talk about. So the first thing that I'm going to do is define the disease that I work with and talk about the data that was available to me um, when designing the research that follows. Then I want to spend the majority of the time talking about how I developed a detection methodology for my disease. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the trends of interest that we have already seen in the data and how we plan to move forward. Now, as many of you are probably more familiar with than a U.S. audience, um, malaria is a very big global health concern. Um, as you can see, the WHO reported in 2019 that there were uh, 219 million cases that year and 405,000 deaths. Now, the reason I highlight this is because the major burden of this is actually put on the WHO Africa region, which is how I paired up the place that I'm studying what I'm studying um, with where it matters the most. So a few things about the disease itself, which are just interesting and not necessarily consequential to the research right now. Um, but malaria is caused by a parasitic unicellular eukaryotic organism of the Plasmodium genus. Um, and there are currently five species known to cause disease in humans. 
The four bolded species that you see here of, are of consequence to the research that I'm going to go over, um, mostly because of geographic bounds. Um, so these are the only ones that we have to concern ourselves with right now. Um, if you live in an endemic region, symptoms of malaria are fairly recognizable if they occur and include things like a cyclic fever, headache, and chills. I've highlighted this because a lot of my research deals with people who don't show symptoms. So it's really important to just assert that um, it's something that you can easily recognize if you've had it. So let's talk a little bit about elimination. Now, elimination has been a really big goal of the field since the 1950s. A really big thing that highlights this is actually the start of the CDC in the US, which is the Center for Disease Control, was actually uh, brought about because we wanted to eliminate malaria here. And since then, it has been a global effort to eliminate it everywhere. One of the really big pillars of elimination currently happened in 2016 when the WHO estimated that we could reduce all local transmission by 95% um, by the year of 2030, um, which is all the way over here in this graph, which I'm going to explain in just a second. Now, uh, in this 2016 assertion, they gave us quite a few milestones to hit so that uh, we know we're actually on track, which brings us over here. This is from the most recent 2020 report. Um, if we were actually hitting those milestones and on track to reach our goal by 2030, we would actually be following this green trend line right here. But as the data shows, elimination isn't occurring as quickly as we thought it should. Um, we're actually following the slower slope um, of the blue line and projected to continue to follow that. Now, um, there is obviously a pretty big difference between this line here and then this line here. There are many different things that can contribute to the hindrance of elimination, and these are the trends I just want to note before COVID-19 interrupted a lot of the efforts um, for malaria elimination. So we were not on track prior to that either. Um, as I said, there are many things that have been theorized that are contributing to why reality is not necessarily matching up with our expectations of elimination. Um, but my lab has a particular favorite, and that is the existence of these asymptomatic individuals in all endemic populations, which carry the parasite and thus can feed the parasite back to the mosquito without being detected. And that's because most of the elimination efforts, um, other than the, the widespread ones like bug nets and spraying, tend to address only the symptomatic cycle because it relies on identifying the individuals through symptoms to treat them quickly and uh, put them as part of the surveillance efforts. So because this is the biggest part of what's addressed by the WHO, we're completely missing this other reservoir for the parasite, which is thus hindering how quickly we can get rid of it because they're just not being shown. Um, which brings us to the data that is going to be utilized in this overall study um, and specifically the detection development for this particular presentation. So all of the data that I use comes from the Africa 6K Top Med project, which was funded by NHLBI, which is the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in the US. Um, and it has around 6,000 individuals included from a, a wide um, range of countries from the African continent. And the reason I say this is because several of these countries are in different stages of their elimination efforts. Um, so it gives us a good range of things that we may see as elim elimination progresses forward um, in, in the, the realm of asymptomatic individuals. So I do want to note that each of these populations also has some measure for us to actually confirm that these people are asymptomatic. Um, for example, like temperature um, or self-report of no active infection in the last two weeks. Now, the reason that this is important, because if someone's carrying the parasite but doesn't have a temperature, this means that they're likely not experiencing the, the traditional symptoms of malaria and thus can be determined as asymptomatic. These individuals have many different variables collected on them that aren't just the sequencing. Um, so they have cardiovascular health variables, general 
demographic information. And these will have higher consequence with following research, but right now we're going to focus on how all of these individuals have PCR-free whole genome sequencing data, which is the only thing we used for this part of the study. So you know what disease I'm working on, why it matters, and where all of the data came from. Let's now get into developing a detection methodology for malaria using only sequencing data. Before we can get into the new methodology, we need to give a little bit of uh, acknowledgement to the old methodology and how it led me to begin to develop this new version. Now, I do want to note that there are two different ways to talk about diagnostic or detection methodology. Um, it's those used in the clinic versus those used in research. Um, even though all three of these are accepted as diagnostic methodologies, generally um, either blood smear or rapid diagnostic tests are used in the clinic and research is more saved for the nucleic acid detection. And the reason that I find this particular method of diagnosing interesting is because it's based on PCR amplification of a parasitic gene. It's the 18S rRNA gene. Um, and the reason that this is interesting is because it shows us that parasitic DNA is actually in all of these individuals' DNA samples that would have been submitted for sequencing. If we can amplify up this gene using normal PCR methods, then there's no reason that the sequencer that received the same sample wouldn't be able at some point to sequence some of the parasitic gene. This sort of framework is what went into the idea that maybe we could pick up these reads that belong to something other than the humans in the sequencing uh, process. Which brings me to the theory behind my research. Um, along with knowing that some of these individuals could amplify up the parasitic gene, um, I do want to highlight that in our sample, the Africa 6K sample, anywhere from 0.01% to 2.9% of the overall sequencing reads were not mapping to the human genome, which means that there's anywhere from 60,000 to 17.4 million non-human reads available for alternative alignment. So this, um, along with knowing that the parasitic genome is in there, brought me to the idea of being able to align it to the plasmodium genome. And we started this, if you can see over here, with the mitochondrial DNA. Um, so let's see if we can combine these two theories together and actually make this detection methodology work. Well, let's go directly into how well it did work, and then we'll kind of diagnose um, how we got through the entire process of making it specific. Um, so the percent agreement, and I do want to note here, generally in the field of malaria, the gold standard is blood spear. Um, but all of the, the samples that we're using here, what we're using for comparison is the PCR-based methodology that I showed you about three slides before, and comparing that to the new sequencing methodology. So we found that they were about in, in the binary call of infected to uninfected, 78.6% uh, uh, similar to each other. And we also found that the, the new methodology, the sequencing methodology, is actually better at identifying true negatives rather than true positives, because specificity is the proportion of people who were called negative are actually negative. And these two uh, values that go here uh, are related to the sensitivity and specificity of the test. This is positive predictive value and negative predictive value. Um, after looking at these general terms of how well our assay is doing, uh, we wanted to see if it was performing also in picking up the different species as well as it was just the binary calls. Um, so what we used to do that was the weighted kappa statistic, um, which is where you consider each of the different species and their combinations their own test. Um, so then you compare it statistically, okay, did it get it right on falciparum? Yes or no. Did it get right on vivax? Yes or no. And that comes together to be able to give us a percentage of concordance. And we found that it was actually relatively high at 85, 84.5, excuse me. Um, so 
at baseline in the people that we tested it wasn't the full population just so you know it was around a thousand people um the the sequencing methodology is actually performing quite well and showing us very exciting results let's start unpacking why we started with the mitochondria and how that is functioning as a viable target at this point so the reason we selected the mitochondrial DNA was twofold. Um, the first one being that mitochondrial DNA is actually usually at a much higher copy number than autosomal DNA. Um, in the parasite plasmodium, it's lower than you would expect of a eukaryotic organism, but still reported to be about 20x over the nuclear genome by this paper. Um, and that's just because plasmodium tend to only have three or four mitochondria as compared to other organisms, which can have much more than that. Um, and then also we picked the mitochondria because the mitochondrial DNA lacks the proofreading mechanism that the nuclear genome has, um, and thus it makes it theoretically more likely to diverge more quickly, meaning that the different um, species would separate in, in base pairs more quickly than the nuclear would because there's nothing correcting it. And yes, I know that this, this uh, graphic over here is quite a lot to look at, which is why I'm going to spend the next couple slides breaking this graphic down for you. This is what's called a circus plot, if anyone hasn't seen it. Let's start unpacking this very difficult graphic um, by walking from the outside inward so that we can understand what it's saying to us um, incrementally. So the first thing I want to know is these labels on the outside are the species of plasmodium that that specific uh, range of nucleotides indicates. And then the underscore M just means that this circus plot is specifically for the mitochondria. And then finally, I do want to note that each of the species has its own color. So anytime you see this specific color and not necessarily the lighter version of it means that this indicates that somewhere in this analysis was, for example, plasmodium malariae. Now, what this means is if you see here, this color is also right here. In this row right here, it means that malariae is being compared to Vivax. How is it being compared? What does that mean? Well, if we walk another concentric circle in, um, what we actually did here was a sliding window um, base by base comparison using Hammond's distance, um, where you measure the similarity in that, that little 200 nucleotide region, and then walk all the way across the rest of the genome um, so that every 200 base pair combination can be compared for similarity. And what we found um, was that there was a pretty tight range of similarity for all of the plasmodium species being set, they were 79% um, similar to each other, all the way up to 100% similar to each other. Now, it's really important to remember that this range is pretty tight and kind of high because these dips and valleys that you see look like there could be quite a bit of difference between the species that um, is more artificially there than reality. One thing I do want to say is that the exception to this percentage difference is actually the difference between uh, the two different species of Plasmonium ovale, which is Curtizi and Wall Liquori. Um, we actually found that these were not anywhere less than 97% similar between the two of them. So for the rest of the talk, anytime um, ovale is referenced, you we have to consider these two things the same because at this target um, depth, we're never going to be able to tell the difference between the two species. So all that being said, all of these are just the pairwise comparisons of each species to the other um, top species that it's under. Through this, we found that there is a potential informative region. Now, what this means is there is a region where the species are at least less than 92% similar to each other. Um, and this is important because in this region, we may be able to use it as a DNA probe to tell us the difference between the species if a reed should land here. So for example, if a reed lands here that comes from Plasmodium falciparum, we should be able to tell that it is actually Plasmodium falciparum based on the differences. Finally, um, we actually have 
one more circle to move in, and that is these uh, different ribbons that you see in the middle. And what this is, is a mauve multiple alignment comparison between the species. And what this does is it takes all of the different genomes um, and separates it into these things called LCBs. And LCBs are just generally these regions that can be considered um, evolutionarily the same. Um, so what we would want to see in an ideal DNA probe would be that there are regions where these, these LCBs are not touching each other, because if they don't touch each other, that indicates that there's a space where the parasites are unique enough from each other that it's not evolutionarily conserved. But as you can see here, um, all of the species actually have touching LCBs, which means that we're working with something that is very similarly related to each other. And another thing I just want to note, in case you're looking and say, hey, there is difference because the order of the colors is not same per, per species. Um, but I do want to just remind you that the mitochondrial genome is, circu genome is circular. Um, so even if these uh, chunks are not in the same uh, one to zero or one to a hundred range, they are actually in the same order because all of the colors are the same in each of the parasites. It's just that the origin of sequencing for the reference was not necessarily the same. So this all shows us, comes together to show us that we've identified a region, even though it's in an LCB of 960 base pairs that could potentially serve as a very viable DNA probe um, to be able to use to differentiate the species from each other. Which brings us to the general conclusion, and I'll tell you how we got there very generally in just a second. But what we found overall when we began to compare these mitochondrial uh, sequencing runs by um, aligning them to the unmapped reads is that the mitochondria actually functions as a very good methodology to call if a person has plasmodium, but we're still working on it to get it um, a little bit better at differentiating the species from each other. And the way that I did this just generally was by taking the reference genomes in that little area that I was telling you that we were interested in and making simulated reads and seeing how well each of the species were differentiated from each other. And based on the work on that, we have, um, ju we're just looking forward to finding uh, other ways to make it a little bit more species specific. So all of this comes together to show us that we have a way of detecting plasmodium retrospectively using only sequence, which is really, really exciting. Um, and is very, very impactful for anyone who's working in endemic regions who may not have pulled together the resources to get blood smears on everyone they collected. So um, you generally know how the detection methodology works and how it came together. Um, so it, it, in comparison to the PCR, was very good. And we found potentially informative regions to use as DNA probes. So in the end, what is the information that this will give us um, that excites us truly? Let's start going over where the epidemiology could fill in some gaps for us. Which brings us to the first thing we notice as soon as we began using this detection methodology. Um, unfortunately, we actually think that asymptomatic individuals are a much bigger problem than originally expected. and we came to that conclusion based on one of the subsections of the Africa 6K population, which was the, the Ghanaians. Um, and the reason we say this is because um, all of them were collected in the Brangahafa region in and around the capital of Sunyani. Um, and that region has a pretty good uh, malaria reference to go back and look at and say, okay, um, in the years that it was collected, for example, in 2005, the malaria incidence was reported to be 29% in the region. But what we found using our methodology was up to 71% of the population per year was actively carrying at least one species of malaria parasite. And none of these people reported to be actively ill in the last two weeks. So this means that even if some of them may have been reported in this 29% of infection, there's a big portion, even if we take that 29% out, of these people just existing without being detected and reported 
um, with the malaria parasite. So this is going to be a really important implication of finding how many people in these 6,000 are actually infected with the parasite with no symptoms. Next, let's go into some of the species thing that we have seen. So when you're developing a new methodology, you always want it to make logical sense. Um, and one of the things that really indicates to us that we're seeing exciting results is um, in Africa, specifically in the Sub-Saharan region, um, the majority of infections are Plasmodium falciparum. As you can see here, this is a map taken from the Malaria Atlas Project, um, and it's actually from 2005, which is where most of our data that has already been out analyzed came from. And as you can see from these bright yellow regions, most of the infections that are seen are uh, Plasmodium falciparum because it has a really, really high incidence in this region. Um, and what we found in our data of the 1,500 individuals we have already tested, 96% um, of the infections that we found contained or were singularly Plasmodium falciparum. And what I mean by contained is um, malaria is a very specific disease that can have mixed infections, not just single species infections. Um, so this together just gives us some sort of comfort that we're seeing the things that you would expect of this region. But um, what we're actually all also detecting is something that is currently not been published on. Um, to date, there hasn't been any um, indication that Plasmodium vivax is existing in Ghana, which I have pointed out here. Now, the reason for that is because in these dark red regions you see in this map here, um, there is a very, very high level, um, and it's not labeled here, but this right here is the frequency of Duffy negative individuals. And why this has some consequence to the appearance of, of Plasmodium vivax infection is because for the longest time, um, individuals believe that Plasmodium vivax couldn't infect Duffy negative individuals because the invasion mechanism is through the Duffy binding protein and thus the Duffy receptor. Um, so it was believed for a very long time that Duffy negative individuals couldn't get vivax infections. However, in more recent years, and kind of driven by one of my PIs, Dr. Peter Zimmerman, um, we have found that there is potentially an alternative pathway that Vivax is using to infect these individuals. And so if we find a Vivax infection, for example, as you can see here, we have begin to look for it. Um, we're going to contribute to the growing body that Vivax is existing in these populations, um, which is really, really important because then we have to discover how it's doing it. So this is just another one of the really exciting implications that could come out of this research and already has started to. Um, with that, I would like to thank you for listening to my talk. Um, I understand that we're having a live Q&A session coming up in the actual um, occurrence of the conference, but if I don't happen to get to your question in that time, um, or you have something that you want to ask me before then, please reach out to me at my email, which is jmo85 at case.edu. And with that, I would really just like to thank you once again, and here are my works cited. I would like to take a second to thank everyone who made this research possible, including everyone in both of my labs at Case Western Reserve University, and those who supported this research through funding. That includes the NHLBI Biodata Catalyst Fellowship Program, which I am a fellow in cohort three, and then a T32 that I received at Case Western Reserve. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jasmine. And uh, we will, as, as, she, as Jasmine indicated, we will take uh, questions at the end of the uh, session. Our next presenter is, is Prudence Masanga. She is a uh, she has she holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Dar es Salaam. She is currently working on her master's at Nelson Mandela Institute of Science and Technology, um, and. Uh, she has uh, been interested in researching extrapulmonary tuberculosis and its association with zoonotic transmission. Uh, 
Her talk today will be Assessment of Prevalence of Tuberculosis and Diversity of Mycobacterium Tuberculosis Complex Species in Manyara Region. Thank you, and uh, we'll start Hello, now. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Prudence Basanga, a student in master's degree from Nelson Mandela African Institute of Science and Technology, and I'm doing master's in health and biomedical science. Uh, I'm honored to be presenting to you an uh, area of my study, which is uh, tuberculosis infection. Thank you and welcome. Starting with my biography, my name is Prudis Masanka and I'm a young scientist from Nelson Mandela Institute of Science and Technology and currently I'm doing my Master's in Biomedical Science with collaboration with Kubomoto Hospital. My area of research is on one health discipline with a focus upon extrapulmonary tuberculosis infections associated with zoonotic transmissions. Uh, my background, uh, I have done Bachelor of Science in Microbiology from the University of Dar es Salaam. And currently, I'm working at the University of Dar es Salaam at the Microbiology and Immunology Department. So, going straight to my area of study, which is tuberculosis infection, TB. Uh, TB has been uh, one of the infectious diseases which has been a burden for a long time, not only to Tanzanian country, but also to the whole world. And the current WHO is changing the story by talking ending of tuberculosis infection by 2035. But this might be a dream to Tanzania if we are having the zoonotic transmission of TB. Uh, because in Tanzania, we have been mainly dealing uh, with TB, which is uh, transmitted between human beings and human beings, which is mainly caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, checking our diagnosis and our treatment, they are focusing on mycobacterium tuberculosis. But uh, talking of TB, it can be caused by other mycobacterium species like mycobacterium bovis, mycobacterium ogis, mycobacterium papai, and mycobacterium africanum. And these are transmitted from animals to human beings and looking at the cross leakage we are having in Tanzania with animals, uh, cattles, it's very important to consider this. And our uh, focus came after the alarming situation which we have been seeing in pastoral societies. In all the years we have been having the cases, many cases of pulmonary TB. Uh, like you can see on the picture at the top, that is permanent which affects mainly the lungs part and it's the one which many people are aware of. But also we are having this uh, extra pulmonary infection which are very rarely to be happening but currently we have been having the instances which are increasing especially in the pastoral societies. We have got this information from Kibomoto Hospital which is dealing with uh, uh, to be patient from the northern part, which are they are mainly um, pastoral societies. Uh, so it's very important to go uh, and deal with this zoonotic transmission if you want to reach the target of ending to be by 2035. So to my early.
So for the management of uh, of this disease and to control this disease, it's very really important that we establish the burden and the species diversity of uh, the Mycobacterium tuberculosis. But talking of the uh, the management, the zoonotic TB, it has been highly underestimated for many years. Uh, we have been just focusing on the transmission between human beings and the human beings, talking of uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis only. Uh, and this has been due to a number of reasons. First of all, we have limited routine surveillance of the disease, but also we the diagnostic tests commonly used are uh, the simple ones like skin test, ZN, uh, stain, uh, and culture, which we just end up on the uh, Catcher stage, the, uh, by using this uh, diagnostic tests, you can't distinguish the Mycobacterium tuberculosis, the infectious, and the other species. So you just get that it's just Mycobacterium species, but not knowing who are the true species. And this is um, very important because, for example, talking of Mycobacterium, the person infected by Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and the one who is affected with Mycobacterium bovis, these people they will come to define their treatment regime you see uh, there are some drugs which are the first line in mycobacterium tuberculosis and they are resistant to mycobacterium bovis so uh, if a person infected by mycobacterium bovis and they, uh, you take them straight to paranathide which is um, which is resistant to them uh, that's this issues will be increasing uh, resistance level in it be in our country. That's why it's very important we go to the uh, the lower level of knowing the species diversity of Mycobacterium. So for So on our study, we, we went further by using the molecular ways to diagnose the uh, patients so that we can get the species which are around our societies and know the burden of TB we are having. So we collected samples from 335 patients, 300 were primary samples and 35 were extracamonary samples. So uh, we. Our plan was to get a large number of extrapermonal samples, but uh, we had a number of limitation, time limitation because of the COVID-19 issues. We did our uh, uh, ethical permits were limited. We, we had a number of limitations, so uh, our interest was to have a, a, a big number as possible. I will check in the future if we can because we are really interested to get to know the species in these extrapermonary issues. Uh, so we got these uh, samples from the patients who are presumed to be patients. 
in Manila region. And the samples were first analyzed by normal routine, by Zedentine, and then we did the culture in both uh, soda and liquid media, but uh, on the first procedures we used the liquid midget culture. And for the positive uh, midget uh, samples, they were taken for the PCR for analysis. And on PCR, we, had, we were doing the matplex real-time PCR, and we had two states. Uh, the first state, it was able to differentiate between the human lineage and the animal lineage. And the second state, it was for those which were animal lineage, so that you can differentiate them to the uh, species level if it's in bovis or in papai or in orgies. So on our study, we, we went So our procedure was, uh, first we captured our samples on the midget um, after the contamination process, we captured them on the midget and for the, the samples which were uh, positive, uh, we took them for confirmation where we did, we captured them on blood agar, we did ZDN staining and the MPT-64. So for the samples which we are positive in ZDN stain and MPT-64, these were the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex species. And for the samples which we are growing breed agar and they were ZDN negative and MPT-64 negative, these were regarded as uh, non-tuberculosis non mycobacterium, which are also can cause infections, but not T TB. And for the ones which were um, uh, in, uh, ZN positive, and they were growing in bread agar, we regarded them as contamination. So we took the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex straight for the amplification in PCR. On the PCR, uh, so uh, as I explained before, that we had two states. We had the first state, which we had the, the premise of IE stain, AT1, uh, mycobacterium animal, MCN, and MTC human. This one was to identify if it's a animal lineage or human lineage. And so if it was for the ones which we have got for the human lineage, we are planning to take them for the whole genome sequencing. And the ones which are if they could have been found as animal lineage, we could have run the PCR again to check with the embovis, caprai, or MOGs. And after that, the after identification, we could have also the 
taking them for the whole genome sequencing and for the so as from my studies currently i've just ended on uh, pistiala so from the minji to culture we get total 100 samples which are positive among the 100 uh, after the confirmation 18 uh, were confirmed positive mtbc 6 were confirmed non-tuberculosis mycobacterium and 76 were contamination uh, then the 18 samples which were confirmed positive mtbc they were taken for pcr analysis to determine whether they are human or animal lineage uh, and when we did the pcr we found all the 18 positive culture acids were found to be uh, human lineage so they were all positive on pcr and they were human lineage uh, the study intends to further proceed with the whole genome sequencing for these are uh, human lineage samples and uh, as I explained before our hypothesis was mainly on the um, extrapulmonary samples and I think we didn't get the animal lineages because we didn't get uh, enough samples on the extra pulmonary samples so this is a uh, just species we go to MTBC and team and the father The 5.1% prevents from culture that is a good indicator as it shows the burden keeps on declining and show that all the works which have been done and uh, campaigns are working. Moreover, identification of these species will be used for in the post formulation of the TB treatment uh, schemes toward combating drug resistant TB. As for now, we are just using the one uh, scheme which is Based on the mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is a human to human um, transmission, and even the diagnosis are based on that. And moreover, to help in management and control and surveillance of the disease, which will foster the achievement of eradication of TB by 2035, according to the WHO target. So, I think this study is very important, and we are looking to carry it further. My master's was limited in time, but we are looking on to carry it further and to do the um, sequencing even after I accomplish my master's. We are looking to do further studies to get all the species which are in our societies and submit these uh, details for policy formulations. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. I would like to give a special thanks to you all who are listening, but also to my founder, African Development Bank, FDB, and Nelson Mandela, and all of you for your attention. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I apologize for the uh, problems we had with the sound in that last presentation. Uh, it was lost to many of us. Um, so I, there are currently no questions in the box, but I have one for you, Yusuf. And um, when I was listening to your talk, especially at the beginning, but it transcended everything, you looked at there was a correlation between miRNA and the mRNA expression in, in, in infection. And, you know, so one of the things that we've looked at in the past is the genetic control of correlations between traits. And I'm just wondering if there was, in fact, you know, if there is a genetic control of that correlation and that genetic control may actually also affect the relative resistance of the Fulani, that these underlying traits are not, you don't take them as a single trait, but you take them as a, as a, as a system and the genetic control of that system. Have you considered that? No, absolutely. And I should just mention that we, uh, the microRNA study, you've only done it for the Guan ethnic group, not the, the Fulani. But I understand that, but I mean, but the point is yeah, that those exactly. kinds of relationships can transcend. Absolutely. And especially in the case of uh, microRNA, it's quite complex. It's not really, I mean, we look at it as pairs, you know, one messenger RNA and one microRNA, but it's actually the truth is that it's quite much more complex than that. Or you can even have one, one, one genetic variant might affect multiple microRNA. And microRNA sometimes can be even nested within a gene. So it's very, very complex. I think, uh, unfortunately, we wanted to look at uh, much more complex analysis. The number of samples that we have for the microRNA study is relatively low. 
the, we were very surprised even by the power that we had, uh, because as you know, we, of the LD structure in African population, it really, really limits this type of, uh, of analysis. But uh, right now what we're focusing on is to really uh, validate at least the, the most significant signal that we see. And of course, if you identify a microRNA, you identify another bunch of microRNA that are correlated with it. And correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. Most actually of the correlations are, are simply associations, but they, they don't necessarily have any basis, uh, any biological, biological basis. But that's, that's a huge challenge. How do, you, uh, how do you tease apart those associations from things that are actually biologically more relevant? The, the, the other thing I should add to this is with microRNA, we know there is a lot of cell, cell type specificity. And what we looked at is whole blood, which even complicates more our mission because we're looking at microRNA from very different types of cells. What's really the aim in the future is to go back to the field and do uh, cell type isolations. Uh, <clears throat> I would not suggest even we do single cell analysis for this because there is no no uh, protocols yet for microRNA at the single cell level. But at least cell types can be isolated, maybe monocytes, T cells, B cells, and then one can look at those correlations within. I think we could gain much more power by doing that type of analysis. Yeah, the other thing that I'll say is when we were looking at correlations uh, of um, genetics of correlations for cardiovascular disease, we found that the power is actually better than finding associations with individual markers. Um, we published that several years ago. It was a small little study, but I mean, we had a larger sample size than you did, but still, um, it, it's the kind of thing that I, I guess, and we could probably talk about this offline, but that there's this whole, basically the genetic regulation of networks as opposed to the genetic regulation of individual factors are probably more relevant to complex disease. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think this, uh, this, uh, even one can think about this uh, variant regulation of variance itself within yes. uh, within genes and within networks, which are even another level of complexity to this uh, analysis. Yeah, yeah. The, the genetics of variance is actually another. You're absolutely right. Um, are there any other questions? I'm not seeing any in the uh, live Q and A. I have a question for Jasmine, <clears throat> if I might. So. Uh, very interesting the method that you, are, you developed and that you are working on and, it, and I just I'm just curious if this can be expanded to look at strains within falciparum uh, because most of the as you mentioned was it 96 percent I think so there is a lot of signal there and can one actually use the same methodology to differentiate between the different types of strains and an extension of that question is there any signal in the data if you have alignment of reads to genes that uh, are related to drug resistance? Can one also track maybe some of those uh, mutations that are, uh, have already been discovered for, drug, for uh, resistance? Uh, you are muted, I think, Jasmine. I'm used to thinking red is when I'm muted and, and not the other way around. Um, so I think the answer to that would be uh, most of this comes down to uh, individual cases where we see how much the sequencer has captured the, the falciparum genome or the any of the other uh, species genomes because it wasn't necessarily or at all targeted to do the parasite sequencing. So we're working up against chance in that. Um, but based on what I've seen so far, Falciparum is probably the best candidate to be able to look at specific things in the parasite because it seems to be at a much higher fold coverage than any of the other ones. So it would be probably the parasite where we could look into strains or look into, uh, we, we do plan on looking for specific genes and if we can get enough coverage in that gene, um, the mutations that are known for drug resistance. But as of right now, we don't have any conclusive data to say that we will be able to do it. It's just, uh, for example, we're seeing up to uh, 27x coverage of falciparum in comparison to some of the other species, which should be um, pretty manipulatable when we get to specific genes. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. I think it would also be very interesting to do this, uh, to apply this to uh, data sets from India, where you have uh, Vibax. Hmm. So we are using the 1,000 genomes as part of our control, and we're con uh, 
putting in all of the samples from that. So I think there's a small sample from India there that we plan on looking for, but we haven't found any other populations to include at this point. But that's a good suggestion. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for our speakers who are now here? Okay, if not, uh, let me see, does anything else pop up in the question? Ah, uh, yes, Julia has a question. Let me put my glasses on to read it. Julie McConney. Uh, true, okay. Please contact Sickle Gen Africa and Sickle in Africa to discuss potential collaboration. Case Western, please see Ahmad who has a point of care test for sickle cell disease and malaria and is part of GGTI. So we, uh, we will contact uh, Jasmine. You can reach out to Julie. Uh, where can I see that chat so that I can copy it down? Uh, let me uh, actually, can you see that chat? I don't know. It's in live Q&A. Can you open live Q&A? Uh, oh, yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So we thank you, Julie. Uh, we will. Uh, we will reach out. We think that this there's potential here to understand more about asymptomatic infection, which, you know, based on the data we have so far, indicates that it's much more pervasive than perhaps comp prior previously thought. And it may be a reason why malaria control is problematic. Because the mosquitoes can still bite people who get it. And for Yusuf. Uh, please contact Lucio and Florence and Moo House. All right. Thank you. Okay. There we go. Thank you, Julie. All right. If there are no other questions, I will call this session to an end. We're a little bit over, but not much. Uh, and I thank the speakers again for really nice talks. And uh, I hope you all have a, a good rest of your day and weekend. For us, it's a long weekend in the U.S. All right. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.